So, so you mentioned a lab, but maybe you could just for the audience to kind of run through that um, the data that supported that that indication. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the indication was based on the Solo One data, which was a randomized control trial, large study, um, where they got people to a response. The majority of the patients had. Um, complete response, mm -hmm. a proportion had partial response after six cycles and then started them within an eight week time frame, randomized to either um, elaborate or placebo. And of course this population was all BRCA mutant, which is important. Mm -hmm. The majority of the BRCA mutations were germline, mm -hmm. although there was a proportion that had somatic mutations. Um, and so they were treated for just two years. And that's an important point. Um, they stopped treatment at two years. And um, when they presented the data last year at ESMO and then with the, the subsequent paper, they demonstrated a clear progression-free survival benefit, a hazard ratio of 0.3. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and importantly, the three-year progression-free survival was 60% compared to 27% in the, the population that got placebo. So it does seem that there's a main, maintain, you're maintaining kind of the slope of the curve mm -hmm. or the, the shape of the curve beyond when they stopped the maintenance therapy at two years, which is really exciting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. and it's it's interesting that we don't have that drop off like we see in the Bev right. in the Bev trials, where where you have that significant change in your progression free survival after stopping therapy. It's really yeah. maintained at a nice uh, kind of linear tail. Here's a question for you because this has often come up. You know, what if this patient came to you a year and a half ago and this data had not emerged? Mm -hmm. Right? You know, a patient comes to you. You're six months out of finishing chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. She's a BRCA1 mutation. You have solo one data. You have the approval. Would you start her at that point in time? How much of a gap goes by before you say yes I or no? I love this question. I know I it comes up all the time. This question. You know, it comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. We struggle with guys, this. We struggle I'll, with I'll this. Let you guys. Yeah. I, I'll yeah. give you my opinion, but let me let me ask you guys first. What do you think I, about I that? I haven't. Yeah. I haven't. No, I've have been, not, yeah. yeah, because I, you know, you. What we don't know is, do they get a similar amount of benefit later down the line? I mean, it'll be interesting to see when the overall survival reads out, because eventually these patients are going to get PARP at some point. And so the question is, do you get the most bang for your buck up front? I think my gut feeling is maybe you do, but but if you've got somebody that's already out six nine months, the that's exactly what we've done. The kind of the damage has so already been you want, done. Yeah, yeah, think, yeah, maybe it's a well. I think there's a couple of points. One of which is we thought these patients did so well, so I wouldn't also. Also not start this patient yeah. if she came in 18 months later, but but we thought these patients did so well. 20% of these patients will be platinum resistant from the solo one data. And, and we and we're not curing really any more than than looking at the entire population. 10 to 20% of the only people who are disease free at five years. Right. So here's my thought on this, um, because I've, I've been toying around with this idea in my mind, and still, still I got to put it into paper. But if you look at the curves carefully, one of the things you'll notice is about a year out, they they they, they start to parallel them each other. So what it tells me is that in this patient population of BRCA patients, they're already, uh, what, you know, the patients that are left with disease at the end of chemotherapy, whether you did a second look or not, they're essentially looking for something to be treated with is in maintenance. So if you think about using uh, a PARP inhibitor in patients with known disease at the completion of therapy, you're getting a treatment effect. And then and when we talk about the next case, which is about um, a patient with recurrent disease, we know that there is treatment effect. So I think that what you're seeing is that early on there is this treatment effect um, that is maintained, but you start to lose the ability or the proportion of patients that are gonna ultimately respond. You've weeded them out. And essentially everybody then is basically on a, on a natural kind of disease progression curve. And so um, and so I would say that if you actually look at this at the slope of the of the of these between these two curves, they start to flatten out and be more like each other, um, probably somewhere between six or nine to twelve months. So that would be what, one of the reasons why I wouldn't support you. It's a really interesting thought. And I think looking at again you know, we we do know that if these patients C125 starts to go up, mm -hmm. that we're going to be quick to to look for a, a, as a PARP option, if not after or before platinum doublet. 